Good news, everyone. Uh, I have I am back, and with decks that are not noise, and the world is yours. Uh, this is Ben from T3, and thank you for watching. Uh, we have uh, this just kick it off. I am playing Kit, and my opponent Gil is playing Jinteki Personal El Personal Evolution. Unfortunately, he holds his cards a little bit out of frame. Um, in hindsight. Uh, just looking at my hand here, I should have kept this. Uh, there's plenty of economy and a cloak, which is what I should have kept, but uh, unfortunately that didn't happen. Uh, Gil had uh, a toll booth, a uh, wall of static, I believe, a Kronos project, a hedge fund, and a celebrity gift. So he installs two of those ice and hedge funds and gets some money. And just drawn up my hand here. Uh, let's see, we see some SMCs and a diesel and no money, unfortunately. And a Plascrete, which I'm sure will not help me at all. I don't often see Jinteki with Plascrete, so I don't really think about that too much. So the diesel saves me a little bit here in that uh, I get that Proco, the Professional Contacts which is really, really good for this deck. Uh, you'll see why, but that credit and draw is really, really helpful. And I'll explain a little bit more of that later uh, after you see some of these cards that I have. Um, I'm not sure if you can make it out in my hand, but there is a Ghost Runner and a Lock Pick. So probably can put that together uh, pretty quick. Those are some of the new Stealth Suite, but we'll get into it a little bit later. And Gil just starts to draw. Um, not really seeming to get anything too great, but installs a pad campaign. Uh, I couldn't make out a lot of it, but I did see a San San. Um, San San and pad campaign, it's kind of shaping up to look like uh, kind of like a Redcoats build, uh, where he has all of those really, really taxing bits and pieces, and uh, try and make my way through. And I'll run on that remote to see the pad campaign, so I, I, I don't know the San Sans there. Uh, in his hand, but Pad Campaign is just a pretty solid card to play. And it costs a lot of money to trash. Uh, part of what makes that so good, a lot better than some of the older uh, Corp cards that were in the core set, where it had a low trash and a low cost, or a, even worse, it was the high cost low trash cards, um, which made it a little bit annoying and not worth it to play as Corp. Uh, unless you could protect it, like Melange or something like that. So he rests the pad campaign, and uh, yeah, on my side of the board, you do see that lockpick and Ghost Runner. So uh, that was all fueled by the professional contacts money, the draw, both the draw and the credits. So it's nice to have the little recurring bits there. Um, in the celebrity gift, I get to see the one Kronos project and a few pieces of ice. The Enigma doesn't really bother me too much. Um, I'm Kit, so uh, it, it does take away my ability, but it doesn't help him, because uh, it's most likely I'm going to be playing a really efficient diffractor to help get me through those, and uh, it's not going to be an issue just to spend the one or two credits to, to get through Enigma, depending on what click I run. And he installs the, the Sansa hand too, so... Maybe we'll see a fast advance of that Kronos project. Um, he doesn't really have anything else to do there, and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense since I don't have the cards in my discard pile, because Kronos project is the agenda that will remove all cards in my heap from the game, <laughs> which is a huge pain uh, if that ever comes up. Uh, I wouldn't want that to really happen, but, you know, you gotta live with it. It's not a recursion deck, so it's not as detrimental as, you know, if I was playing a bunch of Parasites or um, something like that. And on the run, I trashed a Jackson, and I think this was a misplay. I probably should have kept the money and not Procode there. I'm not really sure why I Procode. Um, I guess just to get money. But if I had not spent to trash the Jackson, it would have given me another dollar, which I could have tried to use the Sure Gamble to get me out of this rut. Uh, I, it doesn't 
this deck doesn't need a lot of money to run, but it needs a little bit more than one credit. <laughs> uh, even if I had four, maybe, four credits would be great. Uh, there's a lot more I could do with it. And you can see in my hand, uh, there's another self-modifying code, and a dagger, and a corroder, and a sure gamble. So money would be very, very helpful at this point. And I don't have any stealth credits to actually use dagger, so it's not worth playing unless I get the cloak. Now the reason I think Trashing Jackson was a misplay in addition to just wanting money to get that sure gamble is because I probably should have trashed the SMC here to actually install that cloak. Then I could have installed the new SMC and used that SMC to get Refractor. And then I have a lot more to, to work with, even if I don't have money, because then I can keep procoing up and slowly build up my economy while getting into servers and putting pressure on him for free, essentially, between the cloak and lockpick. Uh, I can get into almost everything for one credit, uh, if I have to spend any at all. Because the cloak and lockpick get me up to strength, and since I'm kit, my first ability, or my ability turns the first piece of ice into a code gate. Uh, and refractor's efficiency is in incredible. So one credit to give a plus three strength, and then another credit to break a subroutine. So with one credit, it gets me up to five, which is about... A, good enough to break most cards. Uh, and against Shinteki, I think that's good enough to break, or to meet, to match strength with all of the ice that he plays. Um, but we'll see. Instead, I'm kind of digging myself into a little bit more of a hole here with uh, playing and, and getting Katie. Uh, I guess I'm planning for more of a long-term game, but I, I think I'm doing that a little bit too late. Uh, meanwhile, Gil, on the other side, is trying to debate what he wants to do. That card that he has installed... Uh, I'm not sure what he has installed with that Sansan, -San, actually. But, alright, so he advances the Kronos Project three times. And what I found out, which makes a lot of sense, I just didn't think about it up until this point, is that his ability to deal me a net damage triggers before the Kronos product Project does. So he <laughs> takes the cloak and then goes to my heap, and then my entire heap is removed from the game. Which hurts a lot, because that cloak I really, really wanted to play on my turn. That was going to be the first thing I did after play the sheer gamble. Um, so he got a really good pull. I actually would have rather lost every other card in my hand. <laughs> um... He only has one ice stacked in front of all the servers, so really the dagger and the corroder aren't helping me out too much, because until he starts stacking ice, they're all code gates. Or at least the first one's a code gate, which is the one that really matters. Um, so it's not as, as good as it could be. But, you know, unfortunately I don't always get my way when I'm running, and I, I doubt you do too, so you know how it feels, and I just gotta kind of gotta roll the punches. His celebrity gift shows me some agendas, and no, the, the we saw the medical breakthrough in the Kronos project, and he didn't have any traps. Uh, so I, at this point, I think the right play would be to attack HQ. Um, I can use SMC, and I don't know why I run R&D here. Um, I don't know whether he has an agenda there. On the other side of this whole thing, I know there are two agendas in HQ. And with the self-modifying code, I can go get my refractor, which I'm going to do here anyway. So I, I pay the money for Tollbooth, then I spend three, uh, two to trash SMC and one to play the refractor, and I pay up to uh, pay the one recurring credit from Lockpick to get up to strength five, and then one more credit to break. So. Essentially, I spent cre seven credits to see one card where there was no guarantee that was an agenda, where I could have run into his hand, spend, I don't know, probably not that much money, and see a card that had a two out of five chance of being an agenda. 
not not really too ideal. Uh, I think that was a, a big misplay. And with the Proco, saw me draw up into a Maker's Eye, so definitely wasn't a good plan of attack. How how I went about it, um, yeah, HQ would have been much better, and then I would have drawn into the Maker's Eye and had more money to still deal with this toll booth, but it would have just been more efficient. And Gil draws a few times, and he's holding his hand so that I can't really see it. Um, I think that was a Bako, a Himitsu Bako, that he installed in a new remote. Um, which again, isn't a problem until he installs something else over top of it. And he installed another card behind it, which I wasn't able to make out. But this play that he has here, where he's making a lot of thin remotes isn't helping him too much in that I can easily get in. Uh, the refractor is the only breaker I need to get in. Um, but it's good if you're planning to build up a little bit more. So <laughs> it's sacrificing vulnerability early for versatility late, I guess. It's one way to look at it. And on my turn, I'm, I'm drawing up and using Proco more, but I have the economy in my hand. I, I saw that I see I have a dirty laundry. So I'm not sure why I Procode to get money when I could have dirty laundried archives to get an immediate three bucks, which would have let me do a lot more than I'm doing now, slowly. Um, I don't know. I, I I just don't think this is being played out too well. And one of the things is I'm afraid against Shinteki with this deck because it requires so many pieces that their damage hurts more. So, for example, uh, generally I need cloaks to fuel my daggers, or I can use ghost runners, but if he's able to take out those pieces, like take out my lock picks, or take out the ghost runners, or take out the cloaks, it makes it really hard for this deck to get off the ground, because it revolves around those pieces. And I play a lot of them, just in case something like that were to happen, but I still don't think... Uh, I, I, I need to be able to risk that a little bit more and, and face check and get those. So this was an interesting interaction. He rezzed Chrissium Grid. Oh, I played Maker's Eye. And before I got to the toll booth, Gil rezzed Chrissium Grid, which is another new card, but it effectively nullifies the Maker's Eye. But since he did that before I encountered toll booth, I could pay the credit and use Refractor to spend a credit, which means I automatically just bounce off that toll booth. So since I don't have three credits to lose to the toll booth, I have to end the run. And I did that to save two more credits. So if I hadn't done it and I wanted to bounce off anyway, it would have cost three credits and then I just decided, nah, don't want to do that anymore. Um, instead, I said, I'm, I just don't want to, I want to keep the money, so I'll spend a credit then uh, during the approach step, and then when I encounter Toll Booth, I have to either lose three or bounce. So then I just bounce out there and keep the two credits. And I, I think I just discarded a dirty laundry here. And <laughs> I'm not too sure why. And uh, Gil advances that card that's installed in the remote. And looking at my hand, there's a lot of good cards that I have. I see uh, Corroder, Dagger, Net Shield, another lockpick. Um, I think that's a Professional Contacts and a Sure Gamble. 
And if I hadn't discarded the dirty laundry, then I could just play the sure gamble. Instead, I have to take all my money from Katie and play the dagger. So I went with the dagger there because I'm, I'm really afraid of the net damage that Jinteki has. So those Kamainus, uh, the Neural Katanas, things like that because of the pieces. And I have all of these pieces in my hand, uh, or at least I have all of my breakers. So I probably shouldn't let those get discarded. That's why I play Dagger. Um, but he reses the Kitsune, so my ability triggers on the Kitsune, and then he reses the Bako, which I can't do anything about, because uh, I don't have the Kuroder out, because the Kuroder's in my hand. <laughs> and uh, his net damage from that takes out the Sure Gamble. So, again, taking out my economy, even though I have a good amount right now, it still hurts a little bit, because I'm just trying to get to a point where I feel safe. And I never really seem to do that in this game. I don't I don't settle down. And I decide to run HQ. I know he has at least the one Kronos project still in hand. So I know there's that. And it looks like in his hand there's another breakthrough. Okay, which I'll I'll steal. And he he deals more damage, which is the net shield. Which I probably should have played before uh, I decided to run into HQ. But I didn't. <laughs> so that net damage stays online and keeps keeps tagging me. So see Ibako, see an interns. And you can see in my hand that I do have that cloak. Again, I have another cloak. Which I should be putting into play. <laughs> uh, I mentioned it before that those cloaks really fuel a lot of this deck because now it's paying the one credit, so I, for the rest of the game, I have a free credit. Um, but instead of opting to keep those in my hand as damage buffers, or uh, as hit points. And he installs a ca another card in the remote that also has the Sansan. -San. And I play the Corroder because I assume that that is an agenda, since I was getting easy accesses from HQ. Uh, I figured I might have missed something, and wanted to tr tr to try and get in there. And it was another that second Kronos project, which I knew he had. But the downside is the net damage hit that cloak <clears throat> that I wanted to play. It, it's all very cir circuitous to me. Uh, I, I just... I'm afraid to run because I need to get my pieces, or I don't want to lose my pieces, but then I get my pieces, and I don't play them. So it might not look like it, or and I know Gil doesn't feel this way, <laughs> he had told me afterwards, but uh, he is in a much better position, or at least I'm giving him a better position mentally, uh, because I'm just afraid of Jinteki <laughs> like with this, and I, I'm still working through how to play it. Uh, so he installs the Jackson and uses it and starts drawing a few more cards. Uh, I guess he's trying to get, get his bits and pieces in his hand too, uh, but I'm able to nab another one of those agendas, and I'll keep going into HQ while I have the free accesses. And on the flip side, <laughs> uh, Gil isn't getting the best draws either. Uh, he's not seeing uh, the cards he needs, which is why he has spent so much time drawing. And a lot of his ice, I found out after the game, a lot of his ice are code gates. So it's not good. Uh, it's already not a, a great matchup for either one of us. And it's funny because we're both afraid of each other's decks really, it seems. Um, I'm able to get some pretty easy accesses, but on the flip side, I'm paralyzing myself uh, against Shinteki because I don't want to take damage. It's it's an interesting kind of uh, dichotomy that we have going. Trying to 
trying to figure out what he wants. It looks like he has a handful of ice and a pad campaign. And icing up HQ to prevent me from getting those easy accesses. And he probably should play that pad campaign. I think that would be his best move. Uh, opting to draw. The, the pad campaigns got him so much money in this game that the second one would be really, really strong and would make it really hard for me to recover. Well, would make it really hard for me to, you know, stop him economically, I should say. But he did have to pitch a few cards, so I'd go and check archives, see what I find, and he's going to shuffle in, I think, one face down and two hedge funds or something like that, or a Jackson. It's off screen, so I'm trying to listen to the audio. Uh, I think he shuffled in a Jackson, a face down card, and uh, a hedge fund, I want to say. But he did have a shock, so I lost my legwork, which I would would have really liked to use. And here it, it's interesting. Uh, just uh, we had some timing things that came up uh, since he hadn't waited for me to ac uh, say I access. I could have said I jack out before I get everything or before I actually access the shock, which would have kept the legwork in my hand. Um, so just a, a brief discussion on that, but not a big deal. It's just a friendly game, so not really a problem. You threw your Gura in front of HQ to just kind of cap off my ability, but the Enigma doesn't really help. So a couple credits to get in and another fairly cheap access while breaking all of that, and see the Baco, which I n knew was there. So we've seen a lot of the ice in his deck, and he does play a lot of Code Gates, which makes him vulnerable, but at the same time doesn't. Um, it makes him vulnerable because I have a breaker that's really efficient at getting into big Code Gates in Refractor, but most of the code gates that he's played are all really low strength with multiple subroutines. So it's hard for me to cheaply get into servers that have a bunch of subroutines. Uh, since this deck doesn't really have the craziest economy and mostly it re relies on the recurring credits of lockpick and cloaks um, to get into places easily. Uh, I all of the subroutines mean while I'm not pumping my break my breakers it costs me those recurring credits to to get in. So it's good and bad <laughs> depending on which side you're looking at. But I don't think I've run on R&D since he rezzed the Chrysium grid and then installed another upgrade which I would hazard to guess is a uh Hakusai grid. And at, at this point, it's just not worth me checking. Uh, I have a fairly easy and cheap access to the rest of the board. So I'm going to try and focus on maintaining that control as opposed to getting the expensive single accesses off R&D. And he ices up uh, with something I didn't quite see and installs what I believe is a philotic entanglement. I know I saw it in his hand, but I couldn't make out what it was. <laughs> and again, a, a marker is to just make me waste my ability. But the good news is that it wasn't didn't cost him anything to res either. So there wasn't a downside, but most likely this next card is going to be a little bit more expensive for me to res. Oh, and it was. It was a Susanu no Mikoto, um, which is strength seven, <laughs> which is a little annoying for Dagger to deal with. Um, 
in that I I can't. <laughs> I only have the one credit on Ghost Runner, and Dagger only gets to five strength. So if I had had another cloak here, I, or a cloak, I should say, I would have been able to get in. Uh, and it bounces me to Archives, and I take the shock, and then he scores Philotic, which deals me like four net damage, <laughs> or something that's more than enough to kill me at one card. So it's a it, it was a tricky matchup. Uh, Gil had a really solid PE that I didn't have any of the answers for, and it took out all of the pieces that uh, <laughs> this deck needs. But it was a good game. Uh, I enjoyed playing it, and I will be back soon with the next match. Thanks for watching.